Hi everyone, welcome to your lecture on everything except for brain structure and function. So everything else that you need to know about the brain that isn't in the other video. Our ability to see inside the brain is actually a relatively new thing. So there's a lot of misinformation out there about the brain. And one of the most famous ones is that you only use 10%. This has to be false for so many reasons, but here's just a couple. One, we don't have a way that you can truly quantify exactly how much brain tissue is being used at any one given time because it depends on what you're doing. Even when you're asleep, your brain is heavily, heavily active. If 90% was wasted space, then we wouldn't worry about concussion syndromes. You would have to be so pinpoint accurate in your damage for us to really concern ourselves with what's happening. And that's just not the case. 20% of your blood supply is diverted straight to your brain. If it was only 10%, that would be a huge waste. Now to put that in a different kind of context, the human body is male or female, anywhere from what, like 110 to maybe 210 pounds. That's a pretty good range. But even in that person, that's maybe 110 pounds, their brain weighs about two to three pounds, less than 1% of their overall body weight. And that one organ is going to consume 20% of the body's oxygen and glucose, making it ounce for ounce the most expensive tissue in the body. So why does this stick around? Well, we all want to believe that if we just put a little more effort in, or if we tapped into something that we hadn't tapped into before, we could be special or experts or superheroes or have some undiscovered ability that we just didn't know. It makes us feel like there's a potential there. And the reality is, is that you do have a ton of potential. And especially as adolescents, you guys really are in this kind of become a superhero phase. You just have to dedicate your time and your efforts to those things. They're just not hidden in your brain. I told you before that imaging techniques are what allow us to talk about the brain in a new way. Some of the imaging techniques that you need to know we'll go through right now. There's just a couple of keywords that you need to know. First, CT scans. This is the cheapest brain scan that there is, and it really looks for structural abnormalities. A CT scan is also called a CAT scan commonly, and it utilizes x-rays passed through the tissue to look for abnormalities or structural defects. Here you would be looking at someone who's going in for a CT or a CAT scan, and it would be detecting something like a tumor. PET scans use x-rays also, but instead of looking at structure like a CAT scan, they look at function. So the person takes in a radioactively tagged chemical and it's glucose. And since I just told you that your brain consumes 20% of the body's glucose, the areas of the brain that are most active are going to consume the most glucose. So we take those x-rays, we monitor where that radioactively tagged glucose is going, and we get this really fun color-coded map of the brain. Areas that are more active will show in a different color than areas that are less active. Here you're seeing those color-coded brains. And again, it's not a lot of clear definition, but you get to see the areas where there's higher and lesser activity based on color coding. Now we're talking about MRIs and fMRIs. MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging. This is gonna use magnetic energy that passes through the body to give you a super detailed picture, better than what you can get into a CT or CAT scan. It's going to give you the images so you can locate things in three dimensions. So it's going to give you slides on the x-axis and slides on the y-axis. Overlap the two and you can figure out in three dimension where the damage is. Many of you have probably had MRIs if you've ever had soft tissue damage, like a torn ACL, or in my case, I've had two rotor, uh, rotator cuff surgeries. And the way that they found and located the damage was through an MRI. fMRIs are kind of like the marriage between a PET scan and an MRI, but better. Now, an fMRI, a functional MRI, lets you look at the brain as it's active while it's functioning. And it doesn't go after radioactively tagged glucose like the PET scan. This monitors oxygen consumption, but it's the same principle. The brain tissue that's more active is going to consume more oxygen. So the magnets actually monitor the oxygen consumption in different areas of the brain, and you get this high detailed, really cool, color-coded, 3D slide-by-slide -slide picture of an active brain. Here we're looking at an MRI. Now this is just one slide on an MRI, but what you can see in the MRI is everything right down to the optic nerve. Lots of detail, very clear picture, very easy to see what's going on. This is what a real MRI looks like. And I told you, slide by slide. So it's like going through the brain and taking really thin cuts. 
the left hand side you're seeing from the outer side of the brain to the kind of middle and then traveling back to the outside and if you're looking at the right hand side from top to bottom you're seeing the lower part of the jaw as you move up towards the middle of the brain here one of those slides showing activity this makes this an fmri so again still lots of detail but this is one just small slide of the brain and you're seeing activity here we're looking at activity in the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe and we're also seeing it through kind of almost the limbic system because it's a almost central cut which is really interesting many of you guys have watched television shows where they've had people hooked up to EEGs or electroencephalographs cephalo meaning head so an EEG all it does is monitor electrical activity within the brain that's it it can't tell you what structure is being utilized or what it looks like at that time it can just say it's putting out an electrical pulse so what these are most often used for and what they're good for sleep studies and studies in epilepsy where there is problems with the electrical functioning of the brain EEGs are neoprene fit caps that have electrodes and the electrodes can only pick up the information from the areas that they're in contact with the scalp now you don't have to shave your head it's just really tight fit like a swimmer's cap and you get this kind of reading an EEG and an EKG seem to give you the same readings because it has to do with electrical activity but an EEG has to do with the brain the electroencephalograph transcranial magnetic stimulation is a newer form of brain scanning technique that actually creates what we call a virtual lesion a lesion is intentional brain tissue destruction and we don't do that in humans we do that when we're doing experiments with animals to see what happens with certain tissue destruction so not necessarily something that we do with humans but if we can create a virtual lesion a temporary disruption in the firing of the brain we might want to do that with virtual lesions at a depth of about two centimeters we can quiet or excite neural tissue either make it more likely to fire or less likely to fire in people who have depression or schizophrenia this has had some application with people with depression we can excite neural firing and hopefully alleviate it from a biological standpoint and people with schizophrenia we might be able to dampen the sending of messages in certain areas of the brain where they're having hallucinations the TMS or the transcranial magnetic stimulation requires that a paddle with an electrical coil be put right in the area that you want either excited or depressed you leave it there for a predetermined amount of time and it should activate or depress the neural firing in that area lesioning again like I told you is brain tissue destruction this is often done today by putting a high frequency electrical current to the brain tissue do not confuse this with ESB or electrical stimulation of the brain electrical stimulation of the brain sends a weak electric current into the brain to help map it this is incredibly important if you're having something like brain surgery they will sit there and give you a mild electrical stimulation in different areas to see what activates to ensure that they're not in the wrong area now yes you can be completely awake and alert during brain surgery in fact that's usually optimal and the reason is is that they will numb every other area but your brain doesn't feel pain and you can't twitch it it can process those messages it just doesn't feel it so the scalp the bone those things need to be anesthetized but the rest of it it might actually be good to know whether or not they're impacting something and you're responsive the central nervous system is protected by a thick membrane called the meninges this membrane allows cerebral spinal fluid to stay in contact with the tissue of the brain and the spinal column the cerebral spinal fluid allows things like neurotransmitters to flow between the synapses and for the electrical charge that runs down the axon of a nerve cell to flow efficiently it also actually acts as a protective mechanism if you've ever tried to punch your hand through water you recognize that it kind of slows it doesn't have the same ability to kind of travel at speed it allows things to dissipate in the interior of the brain you have spaces called ventricles these ventricles are kind of like sinus cavities except they're filled with the cerebral spinal fluid having the cerebral spinal fluid on the interior of the brain allows for the shuttling back and forth of oxygen glucose the removal of waste products 
and it does act as an extra kind of set of cushioning for the brain. Imagine if you were to get into a car accident and slam your head into a steering wheel. Well, it would push the brain to the back of the skull and all of that force would travel through it. Well, some of that force gets dissipated in this fluid. Another thing is, is that when we're looking at CAT scans of people who have schizophrenia, we'll see enlarged ventricles, which also then means decreased cerebral cortex tissue. This is another marker for a disorder like schizophrenia. We'll be talking about hemispheric specialization. And when we talk about it, language is one of those things that resides in the left hemisphere of the brain. So you have a left side brain and a right side brain, but you are not left brained or right brained. That's really important to understand. Left hemisphere of the brain has two structures, Broca's area, which is your ability to move your mouth, which is in the left frontal cortex, and Wernicke's area, which is the ability for you to comprehend language, which is in the left temporal lobe. Something as simple as language, however, doesn't reside just in those two areas. If you were to read aloud any of the words on this page, first, they would have to register themselves in the visual area, the occipital lobe. Then the angular gyrus would transform the words into an auditory code, which is in a different area of the brain. It would be understood by Wernicke's area. It would be then sent to Broca's area, which would then be indicating the motor cortex to pronounce the words or move the mouth. When we talk about this, these different areas are distributed throughout the brain. Language doesn't reside in one spot. And again, that's because if you were to have damage or head trauma, we wouldn't want to wipe out language entirely. But that's the same thing with memory and quite a few other different behaviors that we have. They're located in different ways throughout the entire brain. Now we're going to talk about a homunculus and we're going to talk about our motor and our somatosensory cortexes. Your motor cortex is located at the back of your frontal lobe. So the motor cortex is in the frontal lobe of the brain. Your sensory cortex, or more commonly known as your somatosensory cortex, is located at the very front of your parietal lobe. On both of these cortices, you're going to have your body graphed out and the areas of the body that require more stimulation or require more movement are gonna take up more space. So it looks essentially like this. What you're seeing is the back of the brain in the orientation. You see the cerebellum, the brainstem. So we're looking at the back of the brain and that pink structure is the very back of the frontal lobe. So if this was a person's head, they'd be looking away from you just to make sure you have your orientation right. So that pink strip is your motor cortex. You have a left motor cortex and a right motor cortex. The motor cortex in your left hemisphere controls the right side of your body. The motor cortex in your right hemisphere controls the left side of your body. And if you were to take that motor cortex and take something like electric stimulation of the brain and try to see which part of your body would twitch or move when stimulated, you would find that there is a larger space dedicated to things like your lips and your face than there are to things like your toes. Now with toes, we can move them up and down and bend them, but there's not really a whole lot else that we can do. Compare that to the different things that you can do with your fingers, not just the bending, but the different ways in which we try to utilize our fingers together, how important movement is to our fingers. Think about how much we express when we talk, when we make facial expressions, when we move our mouth to eat, how coordinated all of those muscles must be. They're going to have more space on the cortex dictated to those abilities just because we use them so often and they have a lot of responsibility. Move over to the sensory cortex and we're looking at the very front of the parietal lobe. So your sensory cortex is how you feel, literally, tactilely, with your sense of touch. And you notice again, something like your tongue takes up a whole lot of space. Well, think of how quickly you can sense a piece of hair in your food or something that just doesn't quite feel right, right? It's really simple. And then you think of when you might have something like a stray hair on your cheek or a fly lands on it, you sense that immediately. But you could have a stray hair on your knee or on your elbow and, and really not be that sensitive to it. So again, areas of the body that have more sensation will also graph larger and take up more space. This is just another way of looking at it. And again, you have your motor cortex and your somatosensory cortex. They are going to be in both hemispheres of the brain, left and right. Your motor cortex is in your frontal lobe. Your sensory cortex is in your parietal lobe. And here, as creepy as this version is, you see that your hands and your face are 
far more expressed than other parts of your body. So the question is, what would our body look like to our brain without us being able to visually check? And you would look like this. You would be an exaggerated head with exaggerated hands and everything else maybe just not that important. Let's move into a medical question. What would happen if your arm was amputated? What would happen to the brain? Normally when we think about things that happen to our extremities, we don't assume that anything happens to the brain. But the reality is, is that the brain has to now accommodate a brand new reality. So your body is mapped out in your brain for when it can move and what it can feel. And your brain map has been created by experience, picking things up, moving it, learning to write, taking on new abilities, all of those things. So would that map stay the same if the limb was no longer there feeding it information? What we get from this is we get a couple of different really kind of interesting things. First, we can have something called phantom limb syndrome, where the brain still has the representation of the limb and it'll continue to send different messages down uh, motor nerves to get the limb to move. Well, when the limb doesn't move, it's going to be looking for a message from the sensory nerves. Well, there's no sensation to come from the fingertips. So it's gonna treat it like a limb that's been put too much pressure on or has fallen asleep. And if you know what that feels like to have your foot fall asleep, your arm fall asleep, you start to have a pain message because you don't wanna leave pressure on a nerve too long. It can damage the nerve. People with phantom limb still feel like their limb is there and they often feel like they have tingling or pain in those no longer present limbs. And know that seems crazy, but your brain is trying to reconnect with a body part that it can't locate any time or anywhere. The other thing is, is that you might find that the surrounding body parts may start to kind of grow into the area where the limb had been amputated. So in the case that we're gonna look at, a man had his arm amputated. Well, if you go back to the homunculus and you look that the face and the arm and the hand are right next to each other, what happened was, since he was no longer getting feedback from his hand, the areas that were included in facial sensation started to graph over, started to move into the area that was no longer being utilized. Your brain is efficient. It will not leave dead space unused. And so it moved in and the man who had this amputation said he could feel his phantom hand when he would do something like scratch his cheek. So in this gentleman right here who did have an upper arm amputation, you see how the doctor has drawn the different fingers placed on his face and that's because in his brain, the area that controlled the face or actually felt sensation, the sensation a touch on the face, had started to move into the area where the hand was because the hand was no longer relaying sensory information to the brain. And so it was using the information or that extra kind of un used space at the time and was allowing the face to kind of spread out and take on more area. Well, if you were to then rub his cheek, it would have felt like you were stroking his thumb. Now this seems strange, but this is just another example of that neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to kind of reorganize itself. We will go through these scenarios in class, but you guys can listen to them again here if you would like. Miriam is exhibiting language deficits. Now, the minute I hear language deficits, I think left hemisphere. In particular, she does not seem to comprehend the meaning of words. So if it's a comprehension issue, hearing the words and understanding what they mean, that's Wernicke's area. And that means it's a left hemisphere issue. So I would say the possible causes of her situation would be damage to Wernicke's area in the left hemisphere. Camille displays tremors and muscle rigidity. Now at this point, it really doesn't tell me enough. I don't know why this is happening, but it's followed up with she is diagnosed with having Parkinsonism. So she has Parkinson's disease. Well, too much dopamine causes schizophrenia, but not enough dopamine is Parkinson's. So this is a lack of a specific neurotransmitter and that neurotransmitter would be dopamine. And then our final case is Ricardo. He's a 58 year old man and he suffered from a stroke. He now has paralysis to the left side of his body. So the left side of his body is no longer moving, which means that it has to be a right hemisphere damage. Now he has paralysis and inability to move. That means that it's a motor cortex ability. So right hemisphere, motor cortex, 
and has difficulty remembering how to tie his shoes. Now I know a lot of you go, oh, it's memory, so it must be hippocampus, but it's not. This is a procedural memory. It's not a memory of an event. So if it's a procedural memory, like tying your shoes, well, to me, that's cerebellum, right motor cortex. And you don't have a right or a left cerebellum. You just have a cerebellum. So also damage to the cerebellum. Here's the skull of Phineas Gage, and this is a case study. This case study is about a 25-year-old railroad worker who was literally working on the railroad back in 1848. And while trying to set an explosion, uh, he hit a tamping iron into a blasting cap and it shot almost a four foot long rod through his head. No one believed that this rod went through Phineas's head, but it actually entered right under his cheekbone and exited the top of his head. The iron landed 30 feet away and Phineas walks away just fine. Now the reason this case study is of note is because this is the first time that we really talk about the brain having kind of specific areas of responsibility. People then said Phineas was no longer Phineas, he was now angry and dishonest and he had a kind of a personality change. So here's the trajectory of the rod and again irritable, profane, dishonest. This is what people said had changed Gage. The problem was is that we didn't know anything about Gage prior to the accident. And it was even back then still kind of bad to talk about people who had gone through a trauma or to sit there and say, oh, he was a jerk before and he's still a jerk now. So we don't really know how much Phineas changed or if people were just now attributing certain behavior qualities to this accident. He does die 13 years later, not necessarily because of the brain trauma. I mean, it wasn't completely connected to it, but obviously there would have been some complications. His brain is now at the Harvard's Worm Anatomical Museum, and it's still one of these kind of landmark case studies that everyone knows about. The big thing is, is that it is a case study, and so while it starts this conversation about brain specialization and hemispheric specialization, it's not something that we can apply to every other case. So you've heard me use the term plastic and we have talked about the term plastic. Plasticity is the malleability of the brain. And it used to be assumed that once you became an adult, your brains could not reorganize themselves, that it became really kind of just set in their ways. And the reality is, is that brain plasticity continues throughout your lifetime. However, the ability for the brain to be plastic does decrease as you get older. Brain areas start to take on very specific kind of uh, behaviors and function in a very specific way and as you get older it's it's a little bit harder to kind of reorganize. The adult brain can generate new neurons which is a term called neurogenesis. Uh, most often it's going to be in the hippocampal region so memory and then also your sense of smell which is just kind of interesting that those are the two areas that seem to always have neurogenesis. We are going to talk about hemispherectomies and split brain procedures. When we talk about hemispheric specialization, we have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. And while there's far more that goes on between the two brains, this is just kind of a really kind of bullet pointed cliff's note of what you guys need to know. Know that you are cross-wired, left controls right, right controls left. In the left hemisphere, you have your verbal processing, speaking, reading, writing, and language. And language is the big one. You get into the right brain and you have your nonverbal processing. Spatial processing, which is really, really important to remember music, emotional expe expression and perception, but ultimately you're not left brained or right brained. You need to use both hemispheres together. So if you clap your hands, you're using both hemispheres. If you can dance and move your feet, even though we'd sit there and go, well, isn't that spatial processing and music? Well, if you are using your right foot or your right arm or your right eye, you're still using your left brain. What connects the two hemispheres is this bundle of nerve fibers, and that's called your corpus callosum. It's literally the messenger bridge between the two hemispheres. Without this bridge, the left and the right hemispheres of the brain operate completely independently. But for me to see something that would be in my left visual field, that would get processed in my right hemisphere. For me to speak about it, that information has to cross the bridge and go into the left hemisphere of my brain for me to speak about it. Now we're on to split brain research, but before we get there, let me backtrack and talk about hemispherectomies as well. 
split brain procedures and hemispherectomies were both created to deal with epilepsy. Now, a split brain procedure can be done on an adult, but a hemispherectomy cannot. Hemispherectomies were the removal of half of the hemisphere of the brain, which would include the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe on either the entire left side or the entire right side. This would only be done with a child because you would need that child to have enough plasticity in their brain for things like their left motor cortex to be rewritten on the right hemisphere of their brain or the language abilities in their left hemisphere to emerge on the right hemisphere. We do not do hemispherectomies in adults because the plasticity isn't as malleable as it is in childhood. But split brain research we can do, and this was originally done by Michael uh, Gazaniga and Roger Spiri here at the University of California in Santa Barbara. We'll watch the video on split brain in class, but what they did was they severed the corpus callosum. What was interesting about this is that often severing that corpus callosum stopped the epilepsy, but it left us with some pretty interesting information about how the two hemispheres interact. Now this only works when a subject is looking at a specific spot that lateralizes their vision. And what that means is here you're looking at a person and if you notice in the graphic, the hemispheres no longer have a corpus callosum. There's a nice space right between the two hemispheres. And you have the left hemisphere and it says speech and you have the right hemisphere that says left hand. And what's happening is, is that if that person stares at that spot right between key and ring, what they only get is the information from their peripheral vision, which means key goes into their left visual field and it gets processed in the right hemisphere and ring gets processed in the right visual field and goes into the left hemisphere. Now the bridge is out so the person who's staring at this one spot can say the word ring. They can actually speak about it because it's going from their right visual field processed in the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere has Wernicke and Broca's area. They can say ring. However, the right hemisphere still controls the left hand, the left foot, the left side of the body, and the left vision. And while they cannot say that they see a key because there is no bridge for that information to cross over to the left hemisphere, that person can pick a key up with their left hand because their left hippocampus remembers having seen a key before. Their occipital lobe was able to take in the information visually of a key. They just can't say it. It's locked in half of their brain. Here we're seeing it again with a telephone and a dog. So still everything holds true. Dog is being processed in the right visual field and it goes into the left hemisphere. If the person then wanted to point to the picture of a dog, they would use their right hand because the right hand is controlled by the left hemisphere. However, the telephone would be processed in the left visual field going into the right hemisphere. Because the bridge is out, that information about telephone can't cross the bridge to the left hemisphere, it's locked in the right hemisphere. The person could, with their left hand, maybe point to a picture of a telephone. This is actually my preferred visual for split brain procedure because what it shows you is the optic nerves. In each eye, you have a left and a right visual field. So to the left side, to the right side, and you have this lovely crossover called your optic chiasm. When the corpus callosum is severed, the optic chiasm is not. And so usually in regular life, we're not so worried about split brain procedure because our eyes are constantly in motion and we are looking back and forth at things, feeding information into both hemispheres of our brain. However, it is when you look only at that one spot that you get this kind of lateralization. So cow only goes into your right hemisphere because it's in your left visual field and hammer goes into your left hemisphere because it's in your right visual field. And what we find is that all the information holds true. If it's in the left hemisphere, you can speak about it. So you can speak about the hammer. However, the person cannot speak about the cow, but the person could sit there and take their left hand and point to a cow because the word cow is in their right hemisphere. 